Yeah. Tony, in 1996 or 97, when the coalition was still in opposition, there was a debate between John Howard and the then Prime Minister Paul Keating. And in that debate, John Howard, a question came up, abortion on demand. Okay, mm -hmm. well, I think it was Ray Martin. Which is kind of rare these days, we don't hear it raised much. John Howard came straight out and said, I'm against abortion on demand. And Paul Keating was umming and ahhing, and then interrupted and said, I'm against abortion on demand. You had me shoot which way for it. Um, John Howard was then a Prime Minister for 11 and a half years, and he came out quite clear in his stance on that issue, mm -hmm. and strongly. Why isn't there enough scope politically in Australia for us to have more opposition, particularly at the state level, like Ted Bailey, to come out and have a more robust and moral stance on an issue mm. where there's, where there's presumably the Conservative Party in Australia. Yeah, OK, look, that's a, a good question. Um, and I think it's a very appropriate one for this kind of an audience. Um, I don't think anyone who has an abortion does so lightly. Uh, I mean, and, and look, there would be almost no one uh, under the age of 55 uh, who hasn't either had an abortion uh, or been close to someone who has had an abortion uh, because uh, much as we might dislike it, uh, abortion has become uh, a uh, often subterranean but nevertheless uh, uh, a bit of a fact, uh, an unhappy, uh, unfortunate and uh, uh, ugly fact of, of modern of modern life. So what we what we need to try to avoid is um, tackling this issue in ways which is going to make a bad situation worse by uh, by appearing to brand everyone who has ever had an abortion or everyone who has ever been close to someone who has had an abortion as um, a killer or as an accomplice to killers. Um, that's what we have to avoid because um, if we are to slip into that way of, of thinking and talking, no matter how justifiable in accordance with a certain, uh, a certain um, way of expressing the traditional morality we might think we, we are, uh, it's not, it's not going to advance the cause. I mean, saying that uh, a couple of million Australian women are killers because they had an abortion is not very helpful. So we have to find a language which advances the cause um, uh, and is true to our beliefs. And that's what uh, people like myself have been groping towards. And while someone like Bill Clinton is not, uh, in my opinion, uh, a moral exemplar, uh, he's probably even less of a moral exemplar than I am, um, he did have an interesting phrase. He said of abortion that it should be safe, legal and rare. And the problem with abortion in Western countries like Australia and Britain and America is that it's safe, legal and common. So I think what we need to do is try to get it to the situation where it is rare. Uh, and, and, and I think the best way to do that uh, is not to um, anathematise uh, women who've had abortions. Um, it's not to be too strident uh, on the principle of the subject, but to talk about uh, love and respect and support uh, for people who find themselves in difficult situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions, if I can. And one first from Anna first. Mm -hmm. um, it's moving off the topic, going on to um, leadership style, and Caesar and Jesus mm -hmm. had different leadership styles. Mm -hmm. One was dictatorial, one was servant. Yeah. Uh, and a servant kind of leadership. And I wouldn't mind talking, asking you to talk mm -hmm. about that with regards to the Howard government. And the other one is. Um, how have you found your faith in, in, with regard to career travails? Uh, I mean, you, you were one of the five most powerful men in Australia, arguably, and now, but now you're not. Sort of, I wouldn't mind you mentioning something on the transitions. OK, well, they're very good questions that you ask. And, and 
Um, again, you know, it's sort of a bit horses for courses. Now, I, I mean, there are all sorts of different capacities in which people uh, are uh, able to show leadership. Uh, leadership in the workplace, uh, leadership in the playground if you're a youngster, um, leadership on the sports field, uh, uh, leadership in business, uh, in the church, in politics, uh, in the professions, in, in all sorts of, of different ways. And um, I, I think that different places require a different type of leadership and um, serving people uh, is going to be different in all sorts of different contexts. And I don't think that the political leader is necessarily serving uh, his or her people by constantly saying, well, what do you think? Um, I mean, you've got to be consultative uh, and you've got to be caring, but then in the end you've got to be able to make a decision. And inevitably that decision is sometimes going to be very unpopular. So this idea that the real leader is a kind of a gentle hand-wringing kind of person, I think is <laughs> shit, frankly. Um, there's a place for hand-wringing and a place for gentleness, but in the end, in politics at least, the leader has got to be prepared to say, I've listened to everyone, I've consulted uh, uh, as widely as I can, I've, I've, I've probed my conscience, um, I've talked to the Archbishop and all that sort of thing, but this is what we're going to do and I know uh, it's going to be tough and some people are going to think it's, uh, it's, a, bit, it's a bit rough, but that's what's happening. So, so, so servant leadership, yes, but let's not assume that servant leadership is uh, of a kind of particularly uh, self-effacing, we can't make hard decisions type, because I think in many contexts, leadership is about uh, hard decisions. Now look, as for, for me and religion and, and political leadership, well, um, some people have said to me, oh look, uh, Abbott, uh, you've made an idiot of yourself by, for argument's sake, uh, being too publicly Catholic. Uh, you've uh, damaged yourself by, for argument's sake, uh, talking about abortion. And, and look, I don't know whether that's true or not, but certainly some people have, have said that to me. Um, but in the end, you've got to be true to yourself. And if you think something is your obligation at the time, you've got to, you've got to address it. And, I never saw myself uh, as raising the abortion issue in public life. Uh, I never uh, saw myself as even remotely being considered a morals crusader, in inverted commas, partly for anything else because I've broken so many of the moral rules myself over the years. But, but when I suddenly became the health minister, um, I felt I just couldn't avoid this question of the 75,000 abortions that Medicare funded every year. And I had to have what I thought was a defensible position on that. And the defensible position that I came to, a politically defensible position I came to, was that uh, you know, as, a, as a politician, I administer the law. Uh, as a citizen, I have a view. And my view is that the best you can say of abortion is that it's a tragedy. Uh, and 100,000 abortions, more or less, a year is a national <coughs> tragedy. Uh, and it's something that we ought to do something about. Now, we can't recriminalise it. Um, we can't make every person who's had an abortion feel like they're in some way moral lepers, but nevertheless, uh, it shouldn't happen the way it does. Now, inevitably, even to raise the thing in public, uh, in my position, was fraught. And, uh, you know, there are consequences, but you live with the consequences as best you can.